Thank you very much. It's a great privilege for me to join you today, as on every other week for nearly a year now. Um, I'm among very many, perhaps not enough Jews, but very many Jews here and around the world who've been protesting what Israel is doing in our name, actually since 1948. And in that regard, I want to make a shout out to Jews who are here every week with a banner that says Jews Against the Occupation. And I want to mention the tribute that was paid by a previous speaker to Jews who stand in solidarity. This is very important because, as you would be aware, rallies like this are always smeared and disgusted, disgustedly described as Jew-hating anti-Semitic fests. I know anti-Semitism when I see it, and it's not here at this rally ever, and I congratulate you for that. It's in that connection that I understand anti-Semitism because my mother and grandmother survived World War II in the Nazi Auschwitz extermination camp. Their experience of racism and prejudice is the reason that I stand in solidarity with the Palestinians because today we are not the victims, we are the perpetrators. My mother actually always asked, why did the world look away from the genocide of the Jews and do nothing? Well, today, we know why they remain silent, because we see our government, our media, they look away and do nothing or not enough for the Palestinians. Shame indeed. Prime Minister Albanese and Foreign Minister Penny Wong were slow to even condemn the atrocities and took a long time just to call for a lame a ceasefire. Albanese knows better. In 2014, before he was Prime Minister, he condemned Israel's collective punishment of Palestinians, and in 2002 he said self-defense is not a blank check. We've seen the pictures of Gaza, entire residential areas, entire cities are reduced to rubble. Where is Albanese's voice and his conscience now? 40,000 Palestinians are killed, mainly women and children, and according to the medical journal Lancet, it may be as many as 140,000. This is obviously contrary to the bullshit propaganda, this is obviously not targeting Hamas. It's mainly women and children, and it's not hiding behind uh, human shields. Who in their right mind can accept such bullshit? This is uh, what a kind of a sick mind consider when they look at the uh, complete destruction of Gaza. How can that be even thought to be self-defense? There are no Palestinian jets. There are no Palestinian helicopters bombing Israel. There's no Palestinian tanks in the streets of Tel Aviv. And actually, the Australian judge at the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, Hillary Charlesworth, said that Israel's occupation does not qualify as an act of self-defense. And of course, the other Albanese, the wonderful U.S. Special Rapporteur, Francesca Albanese, she points out, yes, she's a hero and points out that Israel has no right to defend itself against a resistance emanating from the territory it controls under occupation. On the contrary, it's important to say that the Palestinians under international law, under occupation, have the right to resist, including the right to armed resistance. But of course, Benny Wong says there's a need to end the cycle of violence. What cycle of violence? Hamas is not destroying Israeli hospitals, schools and synagogues and entire cities. If Tel Aviv was reduced to rubble, like Gaza City, or like Shujaiya or Khan Yunus, the world would stop it immediately. It's worth emphasizing, as we would all know, but the general public doesn't seem to understand, Israel has dropped more bombs on Gaza than the Allied bombing in World War II, the Dahia Doctrine. Look it up on Google. It's actually an official policy to commit a, a disproportionate civilian uh, murders. The IDF soldiers, of course, video themselves and post it on social media, trashing Palestinian homes, blowing up universities and mosques, running over Palestinian bodies and bulldozing graves. Shame. You would have seen perhaps the doctors testifying after they've come back from Gaza, speaking about the horrors that they've witnessed. One American doctor said, the bombing 
that we see doesn't explain children being shot in the head by snipers. He says, every day I was there I saw children shot in the head. This is not an accident, it's deliberate targeting of children. That's murder. Shame. Shame! Further evidence of this insanity, the lunacy of this country. Ten Israeli soldiers were actually arrested at the city Timon prison for brutal sexual abuse which came to light of the Palestinians. The Israelis rioted in front of the prison to protest not the rapes, but the arrest of the rapists. And Israel parliamentarians have defended the right to sexually assault Palestinian prisoners. After months of Israel's genocide on, on, and atrocities on Gaza, the Prime Minister finally called for a ceasefire, sort of. But by their long silence, Albanese and Foreign Minister Penny Wong have been complicit and enabled the immense atrocities amounting to textbook case of genocide on the Palestinians. It's worth mentioning at this point that the ICC has issued arrest warrants not only for Netanyahu and, and his cronies, but Australia is the first to refer our leader, uh, Albanese and Wong and others, to the International Criminal Court for their complicity uh, in the Netherlands. I'm learning Arabic a little bit, and I don't know how to say too little, too late elbow, but I know how to say, Lao Samacht Rajaan Telhastisi Albanese. If you didn't understand that, speak to one of your friends. We must not neglect, of course, the West Bank. In the horrors of Gaza, the media and the politicians are not paying attention to the immense tragedy in the West Bank, where, of course, there is no Hamas. Just since October 7th, Israeli forces and settlers have killed 632 Palestinians in the West Bank, including 147 children. For years, they have been killing, on an average, two children in the West Bank. You can check that in the Defense of Children International Records. This is a horror story. Of course, Foreign Minister Penny Wong says that Israeli violence and settlement activity undermines, she says, the prospects for a two-state solution. This is the most awful gaslighting. She must know that the charter of the governing Likud party actually says there will be no Palestinian state between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. She must know that in January, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu once again rejected out of hand the possibility of a Palestinian state. Most recently, in July, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, voted overwhelmingly to reject the establishment of a Palestinian state. So much for the uh, uh, peace process and the gaslighting and the deception. And it's worth noting, Hamas has openly recognized the two-state solution based on 67 borders, the international agreement, which includes the acknowledgement of the existence of the State of Israel. Perhaps all of this might warrant immediate sanctioning of Israel by Australia. Sanctions, and that's something that we should all pay attention to. It has now become not just an option, it is now required, according to the International Court of Justice, as something we must do as a matter of our obligation, our legal obligation. It's an imperative. Let me finish by making reference to the important slogan that we all say every week, the slogan from the river to the sea. This chant is important because it was repeated by the wonderful Senator Fatima Payman in Parliament, and she deserves congratulations. But of course, this prompted the Prime Minister Albanese to condemn the slogan as very violent and having no place in Australia, just like Jewish groups and other apologists for the crimes of Israel want to defame and smear us by arguing that that chant calls for the destruction of Israel, that it's anti-Semitic and a call for genocide and the annihilation of Israel. These are deceitful, absurd smears, but they're the clearest sign that actually we are winning. The cause of the justice for Palestine is, is on our side because they've resorted to such absurd lies about our slogan. It's clear that we have compassion, we have justice, and we have the truth. 
and in the context where it's Israel that has entrenched a brutal occupation and apartheid from the river to the sea, it should be obvious that the slogan is a plea for liberation and for justice. And in fact, And we should be listening, the government and other critics should be listening to the Palestinians who have been speaking about it and saying what needs to be said. For example, my Palestinian colleague, Dr. Lana Tartu, has pointed out, quoting, they ought to listen to the Palestinians who've been articulating liberation as an inclusive project of equal rights for all. She says this liberation means equality for all the inhabitants of the land and dismantling the colonialism and apartheid. She's asking for, as we all must, the right of Palestinians to live in dignity and equality in their homeland. And in case it's not clear enough, let me quote one other very important Palestinian. I'm winding up. We should listen to my Palestinian friend, Nasser Mashni, who's the president of APAN, the Australia-Palestine Advocacy Network. I'm gonna quote his eloquent words to camera a little while ago. I'll read it out because it explains why these smears are so inappropriate to demonize and to, to, to create uh, the impression that, that this is an anti-Semitic movement. He says, the call from the river to the sea is a vision for shared political reality beyond Israel's current brutal colonial project. It should not be controversial for Palestinians to reject oppression or to aspire for liberation and for a life in their own homeland free from Israel's racist system of control. What should be con controversial, he says, is that the Prime Minister is using the words of Palestinians against the Palestinians, and that's why we say that Palestine will be free from the river to the sea for everyone, he points out. And he says very nicely, if you have a problem with everyone being free, then the problem is with you, not with the Palestinians.